We're going to be talking today about building relationships in the remote environment. Building relationships is way bigger than just relationships. So I am calling this setting them up for success from the start because there is so much interwoven into the success of the students regardless of the type of environment you're in. But before we get too far, I want to welcome you. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for what you do with and for your students and the fact that you are here tells me loads about your commitment to your students. We're going to play a game called One Word, and I want you to know that you only get one word. You don't get to put two words together and put a hyphen in the middle and call it one word. A hyphen does not one word make. This is another example of a strategy you can use if you're working with multiple students, whether you're in Zoom or on a, a Google Meet, but it's called Waterfall. And what happens is in the chat, everybody types their response, but they do not press send. We wait. And then after a certain amount of time has passed, when you say go, Everybody presses send at the same time and you get this waterfall of all the responses. What one word comes to mind when you hear relationships in the remote environment? If you would type in your response, but not send as well. So take a minute, think about what one word comes to mind when you hear relationships in, in the remote environment. All right, are we ready, set, go. I'll just quickly read them. Positivity, communication, foundational support, timely connection and communication again. So, oh, strain. Yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna try to change that today. Did any of these really resonate with you? Something you hadn't thought about previously when it comes to relationships in the remote environment? Um, I think when I worked as a success coach, miscommunication um, is pretty easily, I mean, you can see that between both, especially if you're texting, them understanding what you're, you're trying to say um, and vice versa. So I know that for, for our mentors, you know, even now we do text a lot, but, you know, we try to communicate over the phone more so than via text because text messaging can be construed and cause tension. And so I know um, definitely miscommunication or um, not understanding really what we're trying to convey in a message sometimes. I want to expand on that just a little bit because the other thing about the relationship is having the kind of relationship to where somebody can say, I'm not sure I'm taking that the way you meant it. Would you elaborate or could you tell me more? I was actually reading something yesterday and, I, and somebody posted something and somebody else snapped back and then the original poster clarified what she was trying to say. And the person who snapped back actually came back and said, I am so sorry, I misread what you wrote. So sometimes our brains just read way too fast and we quickly um, respond before really assimilating. That works in perfectly with the type of relationship we want to establish so that it's not, oh my gosh, she just slammed me against the wall and then I'm upset and hurt when in actuality it was intended to send a different message. So yeah, so keeping that communication well-rounded and open. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I want to comment on what Betsy put here about foundational. Awesome word, because as we go through this, we're going to find that without the foundation of a good, solid relationship, we're not reaching anybody. We are not going to be successful with any anybody. So Betsy, thank you. But when you look at this image, do you ever feel like this sometimes? You say something and it's just completely misconstrued and the brain fires all, all the different ways and uh, it's just completely missed. And by the way, I, I'm using a lot of free images throughout this and I did put those in the resource list as well. So you can use this type of thing with your students, even if it is one-to-one -one communication, sometimes using images, portrays, way more than words might. Remote teaching or virtual teaching or support does not mean distance in relationships. Just because we're not in the same room does not mean distance in relationship. What does it mean then? It doesn't mean distance, but it does mean 
we need to find ways to and then use these ways to create a significant relationship foster that relationship repair when needed ask for and give feedback take the feedback seriously and then keep that communication intact i want you just to think about a communication gone wrong i'm not going to have you talk about it because that's highly personal but i want you to think about communication gone wrong i want you to uh, take two different directions on that number one what was your part in the miscommunication and number two, what might you do or have done to repair that miscommunication? Okay, just I just want you to think about that for a minute. And when you think about the relationship of the person with whom that miscommunication happened, how did the relationship change how you repaired that hiccup? in the relationship. So I just want you to think about that. Our, we are not going to relate to our students in the same way we relate to a spouse or a best friend or our own children, but we do need to make sure that that relationship with our student is just as significant as it is in our other relationships. So relationships are the first measure of success for remote students. But when we think about the relationships that we need to have in order for students to be successful, let's think about the good, positive, strong relationships we have in our lives and what fosters it, how is it created, how do we repair it? And then in that repair, part of that is asking for feedback and giving feedback and remaining in communication. This is what I'm hoping that you'll walk away with today. Now, these are just questions I want you to just kind of have in the back of your mind, because at the, later on in the session, you're actually going to work on your own relationship blueprint. I want you to stop now and think about those students you work with. What does your environment or your processes, what does that reflect when it comes to relationships with that group the best relationship that i can see fostering with my students is the the expectation of us interacting a couple of times a week uh knowing that we're on the same road to getting them across that stage for graduation me knowing that i need to speak to these students in order to do my job and them knowing that they need to speak to me and not only knowing but reaching out doing their due diligence to do what they need to do to graduate and to do well in our program, which is not only doing their assignments, but reaching out to, to me on the, the specific day that we're supposed to speak weekly to make sure we're on the same page as far as their grades, their assignments, the assignments they've done and the upcoming assignments, and just making sure that they know where they are with their grades and the production in each class. If, if these students know that that's what's going to happen every time that we speak and us interacting with each other weekly is going to get them closer to graduation, to me, that's perfect. Consistency, mm -hmm. expectation, mm -hmm. and then appointment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which goes again to timely again, you know, uh, us both being on the same page on when we're supposed to speak and, and patience as well. Uh, because understanding that my students aren't going to aren't going to be uh, even 80 percent, you know, with hitting me the day they're supposed to. Even when they talk to me the day they're supposed to, did they do some work? You know, do I have to send them back in the system to get some work accomplished in order to do my job and them do their job? And then us interacting again after that work is done in order to take care of what I need to as an academic success coach. So a part of what you're saying too then is I, you and they have to have an organization around keeping that communi uh, the communication going, but keeping that relationship strong and fostered. Oh, yes. I love it. Thank you very much. Does anybody else have anything you want to add to that? I am going to put up my next question just so that... Um, so that you're, you can continue to process. Same question at the top, what does your environment reflect? But what might your students say about your environment? And by environment, I mean the ways you work with them, the strategies. What might your students say if they were asked what your relationship environment reflects? 
and again, you don't have to answer out loud if you if you are more introverted or you're more private. You don't have to answer this out loud, but I do want you to answer it in your mind and jot it down if that will help you process further. I think my students would say that the environment that I've created for them is where they know that I'm available um, for them and that I'm consistent and persistent. Um, I think they like the fact that I don't give up. Like I may call 20 times, I may call you know, mom, I may call, you know, because I, I, you know, I care about them getting, you know, to their goal. So I believe that my students could say that, you know, I definitely believe in them and want this as well for them. You know, they know that I care. All right. Anybody else have either one of those that you would like to expand upon? But also, I'd like to add to that uh, our kids would get from our environment uh, a sense that of encouragement that we try to foster an environment that they understand that they are supported, but they're encouraged to be successful because that's inherent in the title. We're success coaches. We want to see the kids be successful surely for that success alone. You know, there's no care in the stick for us to see them be successful and cut their success. That's the most important thing, I think. You know, reiterating all the time to the students as well as their parents when we talk to their parents is that we're doing this together. It's not just you. You have to do the work. You know, I can't go in the system and do the work for you, but I'm here for you every step, whether you're doing well or the, the, the assignments you're not doing well. You know, again, communication is key. So with that being said, I always make sure my students understand that. You have to communicate with me. If you know that we're not going to be able to speak on the days we're supposed to speak, let me know so we can mm -hmm. go ahead and find a day that will be better for us this week. If you're not doing well in assignment, let me know. Don't just stray away from math because if you let me know, then I can connect you with the math teacher. You know, so, it, you know, it's all about them understanding that my place as their uh, uh, success coach and their place as the student that's trying to graduate, they need to understand that we do that in unison. To expand on what you're saying, uh, this is so great. The other thing you're doing while you're setting all of this up and all of you are doing this is you're actually setting them up for success in their future because if they're going to be late for work, they need to communicate that. If they need to be off, the, the situation is they need to be able to communicate that. So yeah, excellent, excellent points. This is great. Thank you so much, you guys. So we're going to take a five minute movement break and here's, here's what I want. It's, we're a little early. We're I'm following time versus slides. This is what I do when I have, when I'm doing professional development like this, I ask that you do three things. I ask that number one, you walk away from your computer for a, at least a couple of minutes. Get up, get the blood back into your brain, move around, rehydrate, use the bathroom if you need to, answer a text message, check your email real quick after you move away for a little bit. I am going to pause the recording and then I'm also going to turn off my camera and my microphone. And then we will be back in five minutes. So 10.58, sound good to everybody? Feedback loop. And it is a loop because we do, we, it's a circular. A lot of times we hear that uh, before you're going to criticize, I'm trying to move from criticizing to giving feedback and and then getting input back because criticizing is automatically has a bad connotation right and our kids don't want to be criticized we don't want to be criticized it, it's just not a positive experience and it doesn't have it's not a positive word when we hear it it probably triggers anxiety if you reframe that to be a feedback that maybe opens up with something like I believe in you. I know you have what it takes to do this. And then move into the strategy called area of improvement or I need you to do. Or, and then come back around and reiterate your first belief, but then also another area of praise so that you're hitting them on multiple levels. You're tapping into their, their learning brain, but you're also tapping into the emotions. And the emotions are absolutely key. So if he's working with a student and that student, for whatever reason, is really struggling, whether they're way behind 
whether they're just not getting a concept. So that student might feel like, I don't, I don't have what it takes to do this. I just don't. And so I'm procrastinating. So are we going to talk to the student about the content or are we going to talk to the student about procrastination? Sometimes behavior is led by an emotion. So getting the emotion behind the behavior is going to help you to build up that relationship to another level. Kids who act out, sometimes we have to find out, okay, this student is not understanding this concept. It's not because the teacher's teaching it, it wrong. It's not because the student is lazy. It's because we're not tapping into the network of the brain that works well for that student. So we just need to find another way. So including all of that into that, I'm gonna call it a feedback loop. I layer it with a, just a little extra layer in there. So layer it with that extra area to where you're tapping into the emotion that is causing that response from that student. James mentioned sometimes students um, don't show up for their appointments, they don't call back, they don't text back. And I know it was mentioned that sometimes you call 10, 20 times a week before you got that response. Uh, tap into the emotion as to why they're not answering their phone. What is it that's stopping them from answering that phone? How do we expand what we're already doing? So you've already established a relationship with your students, but how, how do they perceive that relationship? And then how is it fostered? The student has to foster the way you do too. It, it works both ways. But I wanna tell you a little bit about one of the areas that I've been studying. And one of the best books, one of the best resources that I found is this book and it's called Five Languages of Appreciation in the Workspace. And I'm sure, or workplace, I'm sure somebody's going, why are you showing us that? It's because the concepts in this book can be used in any relationship. If he's praising, so if, if he's praising me and he says, wow, Ann, I'm just going to really broadcast to the whole class how well you've been doing, that is not praise to me, Ann. That is embarrassment. I don't want to be called out. I don't want to be singled out. I don't want to be pointed out. And I, I do not want to be the center of attention. That is Anne. I've been that way my whole life. So what does that mean? Well, when I think about the, how do you know you're appreciated? I just want you to think about that. If you want to holla, go ahead and holla. Some people like gifts. Some people just want to hug. Some people just want to say, hey, thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Others want quality time. Let's go for a walk. Let's go to a movie. So which, what works for you for your language? And, and the other one is some people like to have things done for them. So how do you know you're appreciated? I'll tell you mine. Mine is simply, thank you. That's all I need. So for me, it's words of appreciation and affirmation. How do you know you're appreciated? Well, truthfully, I, I think, uh, it, you know, it's easy to verbally say, you know, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, you appreciate it, but, uh, and that's great as well, but I like to see it. You know, you could tell me anything, but I like to be able to see it and feel appreciation uh, because it's easy to say, hey, good job. Mm -hmm. But if I don't feel that I'm appreciated, then, you know, that, that you know, it's not going to have the, the, the power that it should when you're saying thank you. If I know that I'm being trusted to take care of my responsibilities and given the, the room to do my job effectively, I'm trusted to take care of that and do it in a professional manner, that goes a long way to show that I'm appreciated. Yeah, your autonomy is respected. These five are the actual five languages of appreciation, words of affirmation and thank yous, quality time, acts of service, tangible gifts, and physical touch. So think about how you can use these with your students. Obviously, you're not going to have physical touch because you're not in the same room with them. But do you ever connect with your students on video? I'm going to encourage you to do that. And the reason I I'm going to encourage that is because you, they'll see your face. You were talking earlier, we were talking about earlier how text messages and emails may not convey. So even if you just FaceTime for five minutes, 
or you use a quick Zoom or a quick meet just to see their face, hear their voice and have them see your face and hear your voice. And you can just say, hey, thanks. Oh my gosh, thanks for meeting with me today. And then you can also say to them along the lines of thanks for uh, staying up on top of your work too. I noticed that your work is not only top of the line, but you're very timely in getting your work done. They need to hear those things. They need to know those things, but it's important for them to hear it and to see your face in, in doing that. And you can do a a uh, virtual high five, and that's kind of that physical touch representation. Tangible gifts, it can be write them a card home, send a card to their home, and then that's that tangible piece. It doesn't have to be a gift card, or you don't have to send a, you know, a cookie bouquet or anything like that, but a thank you note is tangible, something they can hold on to. So thinking about ways that you can take these languages of appreciation and move them into your relationships with your students to improve and foster. How do you know what their language is? By noticing, okay? So if they thank you or they you know, send you a quick note or a text, thanks for your help today, they appreciate words. And notice and try out some of these different types and see what they respond very, very well to. I send out a quote once a week to my students. And there are, you know, quite a few that's like, oh, I needed that, Miss Q, or, you know, thank you so very much. So I do think that that's an affirmation for them. For sure. Just, just an encouragement, you know, once a week. And once a week is enough, unless you have someone who needs more than once a week. And if you have someone who needs more than once a week, it is on you to make sure you give them that connection to keep that relationship strong and so that they feel your appreciation, affirmation all the time. Because exactly what was said earlier is it has to be a feeling, a feeling. How many of you absolutely love it when you can get a hug? It feels good. You feel your endorphins move and there's a physical reaction to a hug. How many of you love getting a little present? Just a little gift. That's a, that's a number four. Acts of service. Let me do the dishes for you tonight, honey. You've had a long day. You're tired. Go put your feet up, please. Let me bring you a glass of wine, a um, hot drink, your soda. Acts of service. And then there's quality time. Let's go take a walk together. And then, of course, the words of affirmation. So what you just said, the quality time, that face-to-face, -face, that is also quality time. You may be giving them their thanks and at words of affirmation, but you are also giving them your time. So think about how these mesh into what you're doing and how you can share these with your students and watch for cues as to what works for them. It's going to really expand your learning, your growth, and then your relationships with them are also going to blossom. A lot of these kids have never had those affirmations before. That's an excellent point. And, and also think about, are they an introvert? Are they an extrovert? If they're an introvert, more than likely, their language of appreciation is going to be very different than an extrovert. So think about that also, remembering that extrovert doesn't mean gregarious and outgoing. It means I recharge my batteries by being around other people. My sister is such an extrovert. She just has this huge circle of people. And if she could, she'd go out every single night and just hang out with her peeps. I'm an introvert. I love people but I don't want to be around people when I'm overwhelmed, when I'm tired, or when I've had a really busy week. Leave me alone. Give me my solitude. Let me rebuild that way. And finding out what works for your students too. Ask them what works after you've had a long day of either working, whatever their responsibilities are. What do you do to recharge your battery so that you feel strong again to go out and do it again? Find out, and that'll give you a lot of clues as to how to work with them as well. So going back again to building those relationships and what Betsy said earlier about it being foundational, let's talk just very quickly in this, but what are the main benefits of relationship building with students, student, teacher, teacher, student? So obviously the big picture is we want to promote academic success with positive student-teacher relationships, teacher-student relationships. 
research shows that the students who are most successful are the ones who have the strongest relationship with their teacher, instructor, mentor. So establishing a strong bond with each student, but finding out which way they want to establish that bond and uh, what works for them. You know, some people, do not, they don't want to get emails. They much, would much prefer a text or a voicemail or, like we talked about a, a few minutes ago, a face-to-face, -face, whether it's FaceTime or Zoom. And then clearly expressing your, your expectations for the student. So there's nothing wrong with saying, I just gave you a compliment. I need to hear thank you. We're going to practice that. That's a lifelong skill that they need to have even going out into the workplace. So making sure your expectations are positive. If I were to turn it around and say, in what ways can I support you in getting your work turned in on time, as that is an expectation in the classes, and it's a life skill, how can we work together so that you are successful in that area? Presenting students with opportunities par to participate. So again, asking them, how can we work together to achieve? And that achievement goal may be different for every single student. It's a matter of finding that out and then expressing that confidence. So what can we do to work together? Because I truly believe you can do this. We need to work together. It's we, not you or me. So those are the benefits of it. Research very deeply shows the relationships and that's in the face-to-face -face classroom as well as, as the remote. So that should be your first priority before you ever work with a student on content or processes, you establish that relationship. Can I ask before, can we go back to the previous slide for just a moment? Can you maybe speak just a little bit to point D? Yes, so acknowledging their feelings in order to understand their behavior. So if you have a student whose work is exceedingly late, what is the feeling behind that? Is the feeling, I'm a failure, I can't do this, I'm afraid to ask for help, or is it, I'm overwhelmed right now? A lot of those students, they don't even know how to articulate a feeling. They don't know what a feeling is. They don't know, you know, they might know, oh, I feel good or I feel bad, but they don't know what frustration is. They don't know what resentment is. So working with them to put a label, understanding, oh, it sounds like you're really resentful of the fact that you are the one that keeps being forced to work overtime when you're trying to go to school and help out at home. So helping them to understand them as well as acknowledging, okay, now I understand the struggle you're having with, whether it's responding to your emails or getting their work done, understand it and put words to it and then go back to where right here, B, clearly expressing those expectations and then that confidence. So it really is a, it's a bubble that contains all of this stuff together. We don't do this part and then maybe I only feel like doing this part. It all has to come together to create that solidified relationship. So, um, you know, one of the, the things that we hear from our mentors sometimes, and I certainly believe it's authentic, is that, you know, we would sometimes talk about point B but we would replace feelings with responsibility. Um, a lot of our older students, because of their multifaceted responsibilities, frankly, school isn't and probably shouldn't always come first. Oh, I absolutely agree. And I'm, I'll go back to this one too. So I see where B, C, and D would tie into responsibility. Some students, and when we think about overwhelming, there are times, especially in the last six months, where we've had to pick and choose. Am I taking care of myself today or am I going to run myself into the ground with my job? So even working with them to teach them how to balance their responsibilities and when they are supporting family members, whether they're their own children or mom or dad, or I'm helping out with the younger kids at home or I'm living on my own, so I have to pay my bills. So yeah, so school is not a priority right now. Even helping them to understand that it's okay number one, to not have school be a priority all the time, but there are times when school needs to be that priority. So even helping them work that, that out with them, that's going to be through that bond with each student because it's mm -hmm. not going to be the same for every one of them. So yes, I love that you brought up the responsibility of 
the pieces of their jobs and understanding and acknowledging their feelings, but also those outside responsibilities. I think sometimes we're, we're like playing double dutch with that, you know, because we kind of don't want to intrude. But sometimes when you get more information about their life and their family, it'll give you a greater understanding of how you can help navigate them in this process. I, I had a student recently that she just really is not, she's not working much. And I was trying to understand why, because she's a very bright student and, you know, what's going on and I know she was working. So I asked her her family dynamic and she said she lived with her mom. So I asked her, where's mom? Can we get on speaker so that I can have her and mom together? And I, um, and I said, well, you know, you're so close. I, you know, I would like for you to make sure that school remains a priority because you're so close. And mom said, I'm disabled and I've been disabled for about six months and she has to work because she has to help with the household. And, you know, she expressed that. And I was like, oh, you know, and, and I said, wow, I wasn't aware of the circumstances. Yep. And so I gave her all of the options need that we can do during her breaks on work, um, her texting me and her emailing me and all of the options that I have available so that we can get this done. And then I mentioned to my mom, she's three credits away from getting her diploma. And mm -hmm. mom said, whoa, because mom didn't know. And so therefore I feel that mom will be more of a support, you know, with her going forward with school. You broaden that scope. You broaden the scope, not only of your relationship with the student, but you also brought mom in. So now the relationship between student and mom is also broadened. So you brought growth on so many levels. So you mentioned, you know, sometimes, okay, are we being intrusive? So one of the, a strategy you can incorporate there is say to the students, as you're working with them, especially if you're in a little bit of a sensitive or a tenuous situation, you can preface your question by saying, I'm going to ask you a question. And if you don't want to answer me, you don't want to tell me the answer, that is fine, but I want you to think about it. Then you get them to start thinking and processing. And so had you not worked with mom, that might have taken longer by saying, I want, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. I want you to process it, think about it. It might have come out a week later, two weeks later that, oh, mom is disabled. And so the student has had to take on going back to Marty's word early responsibilities that um, many of us couldn't even fathom at that age. And so not only did you lend support to the student, but you also gave support to the mom. Ask the questions anyway, because if you don't probe, and I'm not talking about being nosy, it's very different, and you can preface it with saying, as your mentor, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, I just want you to think about it. If you want to talk about it, I'm available whenever you need to. If, but if you want to just think about it, that, that is perfectly fine too. Our students are so programmed that when, they, when they're asked a question, they think they have to answer. People will say to you, can I ask you a question? And what do we say most of the time? Yeah, sure, go right ahead. I have learned to say, you may ask me anything you want to, but I reserve the right to not answer. I'm empowering myself, but I'm also affirming that other person. And if they ask me a question that's highly personal, then I'm going to say, I'm, I'm not going to answer that question. I might answer it in a few days after I've processed it, but I'm not going to answer that right now. So giving them those skills also. The other thing you did in that is you were modeling how to not just foster a relationship, but how to broaden that relationship. That's a, a wonderful uh, example of keeping in mind the, that behavior, the feelings behind the behaviors. Frustrate, it could be frustration, it could be overwhelmed, it could be scared. I mean, my gosh, your mom's disabled all of a sudden. It takes more than six months to really assimilate that and to learn to live with and through that. So thank you for that example. I mentioned this, it helps with your personal growth, your communication skills, and your reflections. After that conversation, I'm sure you had some deep reflection going, wow, I had no idea. How might I learn more about my students' lives through this experience that I just had.
Let's just talk really quickly about what makes that relationship. Many of you mentioned you contact your students once or twice a week. You have kind of that um, schedule, that consistency. But one of the things that is highly important is that flexibility. So going back to the student and the mom, you're probably checking in with her a little more often than you had prior to that information. Make sure she's okay. See if mom needs anything. What kind of services might they need that you can help them find? Do they need some public service? Do they need a, to have a disability advocate meeting with them? One thing I do want to talk about right here is silence. Sometimes sitting in silence with your student while they process is the best gift you can give them. Remember, silence, process, yes. And sometimes you may have students who cry and they're upset and you just sit in silence and hold their heart while they cry. Give them that instead of saying don't cry, let them cry and when they, they slow down a little bit, they say, what might I do to help you through this? But then how do we maintain connections? A lot of times our communications are the same. We email, we text, we call. Now you know, write them a card. Even if it just says, hey, I'm thinking about you today and hoping that your job interview goes great. Maybe their child turns two and they're excited about the birthday party. Send a little birthday card to that child and just show that you really care and maintain that connection. But also choices. Give your participants, your students choices. How do you want me to communicate with you? What works best? I'll tell you what, I much prefer text messages about 90% of the time than I do a phone call. That's part of that introvert in me. Give them the choices. What works for you? And that comes back also to that um, level of appreciation, extrovert, introvert, and then invite them. Use these invitations, invite them to join you. I'd like to invite you to do a FaceTime with me so we can connect. Remember, facial expressions are everything. Feedback, are you asking your students for feedback? Are you getting feedback about your relationship, about their needs and about how you are communicating with them. Ask them for feedback, but remember to also give them feedback. Last time we were on the phone, we only got to talk for a minute because you were in a hurry. How can we make sure that doesn't happen at our next phone call? We have to remember to make it work for them, not just us. So remembering that flexibility, finding out what my groups need and meeting those needs in their ways. Sometimes I have to step out of my comfort zone in order to meet their needs and that is my job. So keeping that in mind. Rethink what you're doing, re-examine what you're doing, and in the cases that you need to, redesign what you're doing. And then here's your relationship blueprint again, those same questions I put up at the beginning. I'm not going to have you answer them now because what, number one, we're running out of time, but it's also, this is really deep thinking here. And then these are the resources I have for you. The top are links to either articles or a tool that the student might want to use. I do have alternative programs have uh, learning struggles. So why are we not teaching them how to use Immersive Reader or Office Lens to translate things, to turn it into a method that their learning brain needs and supports? So I have a few of those here. And then these are some extensions that I use as well myself, but they're also really, really great for the student to be able to use in communication or their own note taking in their learning. Working with them to find out what their learning brain needs. Just for example, are any of you Cami users? Are you familiar with Cami at all? It's amazing. You take a PDF, you um, open Cami up, you can mark it up, you can put squares on it, you can put drawing on it. It's just a wonderful all the way around annotating tool. These students are learning in a virtual environment. Teach them how to 
use tools to support virtual learning. Reading a virtu uh, virtually is extremely different than reading on paper. Our brains function very differently in those types of reading, but not only do they function differently, we're actually using different brain networks when we're reading uh, using a device versus when we're reading on paper. And I thank you for what you're doing for the students because they not only, number one, do they need you, but and they may not know this, but they really want what you're bringing to them. So elevate it, bring it to a new level, teach them what it means to be in relationship. Yes, you are still an authority, if you will, in their life, but teach them what it means to be reciprocal in that relationship and then again asking some of those questions and modeling what questions might you have for me and they might say something well um do you have any kids they want to know a little bit more about you on a personal level so answer it and if they might say hey what kind of car do you drive or you know you're not in the same town as i am in what where do you like to eat talk about some of the personal stuff that makes them who they are. That's, those are just, just ways to get deeper. I think a lot of times we think as teachers, we don't, we don't have a right to ask those questions because we're being, again, nosy, but we do need to know those things. We need to know what makes them who they are outside of that learning brain. So I uh, thank you very much, number one, for being here, for your participation. I really appreciate your vulnerability in the sharing that you've done throughout today. But again, I thank you for what you're doing for the students because they not only, number one, do they need you, but and they may not know this, but they really want what you're bringing to them. So elevate it, bring it to a new level, teach them what it means to be in relationship. Yes, you are still an authority, if you will, in their life but teach them what it means to be reciprocal in that relationship. And then again, asking some of those questions and modeling. So I thank you again. Thank you for what you do. I thank you for being here today. And I thank you for your vulnerability and your responses and your questions. Any questions for me?